please welcome the CEO of Jumeirah Group, Katerina Gianuka, in discussion with Skift President, Carolyn Kremins. your faces. Katerina, thank you so much for joining us. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Katerina came in right from Dubai. Um, so yeah, that jet lag is probably kicking in about now. Just right? a few hours, <laughs> just a few hours, but it's all good. Uh, anyway, Katerina, this is your, I think, your first um, global interview as the new CEO of the Jumeirah Group. And uh, we're really so excited to have you in, at the helm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Katerina comes to uh, Jamura after a decade in the Asia re region, and um, so you have an interesting perspective. I would love just um, to kick off and hear about what are your first impressions, not only of the region, but of Jamura itself? Well, I first moved to Dubai just uh, like three months ago, so quite fresh. And of course, I've been to Dubai in the region many times before, but it was the first time I've actually put roots down there. And I've been absolutely amazed by the dynamism, the pace, the energy. And it really feels like it's the place to be right now. You know, there's a lot of turmoil in the world, and um, it really feels like Dubai is the center of a, a, a region that's up to great things. And um, I used to live in Hong Kong, and I feel that vibe. There's something really fun about it, and um, I just really wanted to be part of it. So I'm delighted to be with Jumeirah and be able to be part of a region of the world that is really uh, committed to growing in a very like uh, welcoming and inviting way, where you know the the aim of you know the aim of Dubai is to make sure that everyone who lives there is is thriving uh, from businesses to individuals, and what we've observed uh, recently is that it's moved from being uh, maybe more tourism or more kind of leisurely and transient type of uh, location to really attracting a resident population. And it's booming. I mean, it's now the fourth largest market in terms of luxury real estate sales in the world after New York, London, and Dubai. So in New York, London, and LA, uh, they have um, committed to grow tourism from about 17 million in 2019. They want to hit 40 million uh, by 2030. So these are really, really big targets. And to put that in context, um, you know, um, Paris is about 30 something million uh, tourism a year. So they really want to play up there with those big cities of the world. And it's a, it just feels fantastic. And then leading Jumeirah, we're really, uh, we're really a top player in the region in Dubai with a very strong base of truly magical hotels. I mean, <laughs> you were there in December. Yeah. And I've been positively overwhelmed by the strength of the team and also the product we have today uh, of our hotels in the region. So I feel like I'm in the right place. Yeah, well, congratulations again. And uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing. I, I went to Dubai right like shortly after COVID and it was amazing how much uh, energy there was and how everyone was back at work, and I think more, more so than almost any place in the world that I, I saw. Um, so before we get into the trends and um, lifestyle and luxury conversation, um, I'm sure everyone here wants to know what is your mission um, as the CEO, and um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Jumeirah, um, there are 26 properties. It's an Emirati-based company. It's actually owned by Dubai Holdings. And um, you have five of your hotels now in Europe. The fifth you just acquired, it's in Switzerland. Um, so as you're looking forward and, and your mission, are you looking to expand more into Europe and elsewhere uh, and, and make further acquisitions? Yeah, I mean, one of the benefits of um, having a large proportion of our portfolio in, in the Middle East, in Dubai specifically, is um, since the market's been booming and we really took the opportunity of COVID to um, really make sure that the, the company's running uh, at a very great level. And that gives us the financial capabilities to expand the business now. Uh, now, as a 26 property um, portfolio, we do realize that the way to grow at the pace we want to grow is to invest. So we just, as you mentioned, acquired uh, Le Richemont in Geneva, and we do have a strategy to continue investing in really trophy assets and key assets that are going to help us bring that level of hospitality that we know from, from our hotels today in the region uh, out to the world. So we do want to invest in more properties in Europe. Um, kind of in the medium term, we want to grow through hotel management agreements too. 
uh, but we absolutely have a commitment to lead that way and to we're looking for, for key assets and you know places that are of interest to us and continue to be in Europe, the gateway locations. Uh, Madrid is really hot right now. Uh, Milan, you know, Rome, we have a small hotel that we'll, we'll, uh, is currently leased to another operator. We'll convert that over to Jumeirah one day. And we're looking for other key locations that will help us solidify, be it city, resort, city locations and also key resort locations. And then the question is, do you, do you kind of grow out, do you continue to grow our portfolio in Asia? We already have um, five hotels. Right. Do we continue to invest in Asia? Probably. And also then you've got, we've got the Americas, so what's our route in there? Now, we have to see what opportunities emerge. You know, if you want to go <laughs> spend some of money today, that doesn't mean to say that the opportunities are there. But we absolutely do have plans to strategically grow the portfolio into those regions. Nice, nice. So if anyone hears of anything, <laughs> yeah, let, let, me her, know. let her know. Uh, <laughs> so, um, I, I, and, uh, you know, you, you come from, uh, you know, uh, spending time in APAC and now in the Middle East, you have an interesting perspective. Um, in terms of emerging markets, like there's some exciting places in the world. What, what do you see as like a good opportunity for investment? What, what, what excites you? Um, what parts of the world? Uh, well, we do. We have a pipeline that I think reflects some of our interests. So uh, we'll be opening um, a hotel at the Red Sea uh, next year. This year we'll be opening a hotel in Mecca. I think a lot of you are hearing about Saudi Arabia. They really have huge plans to grow to 100 million visitors within the next decade. Uh, but also, we've recently opened hotels in, um, on the F1 circuit in Bahrain, uh, in Oman, in Muscat, at a beautiful beach location. So that's uh, some of our existing um, portfolio. And then, I mean, we're opening another hotel in Dubai uh, within a year. So these are, I would say, emerging markets in the Middle East. There's a, there's a lot of wealth that's transitioning now through generations and, and also the emerging middle class. So there's a lot of volume of new travel coming out from um, luxury travelers in the region. But looking uh, a little bit more further afield, we all, we all know about the very strong China outbound market. We're starting to see that coming back right now. Uh, a lot of it depends on air capacity and on visa-free tra visa travel or even issuance of passports in China. There's still uh, limitations on travel outside of China, but that market will come back. We're super excited to welcome back uh, Chinese travelers to Dubai and to our hotels. We've got Bali, uh, Maldives. Uh, but then I'm also really excited and curious about some of the markets that we have really pole position to capitalize on in, in Dubai. And uh, we, see, we saw that um, the, from sub-Saharan Africa and southern Africa, really market, the demand from market that more than uh, increased by nearly 25% last year. And I expect that will continue at double-digit growth. So there's still niche markets, but we're really seeing uh, a new level, level of middle class and high net worth individuals uh, coming out of those African, sub-Saharan African states. And it's just great when you look around our lobbies in Dubai, you really see this melting pot of cultures and people from all, all across the world. And um, I think that we, you know, again, being, being an early mover in that space or being able to welcome travelers from that region, understanding them, really they have, they have a little bit more specific taste to be able to, to make sure their needs are met. And then India is fascinating yeah, as yeah. well. I mean, we get a large share of uh, India visitors to the region, to Dubai and our hotels. And uh, I, I did, you know, I spent a lot of time there. I'm really passionate. I think uh, out of the pandemic, uh, in, in, within India, people discovered, the, the, they, they rediscovered their own country and at another level of luxury and, and spending. And um, I think that market's just gonna come out and, and we're gonna be able to welcome them as well. So those are some of the more niche markets, but um, with really strong potential and um, really believe that by understanding them and catering and making sure that we've got, we understand their needs, we speak to them in, in their language. Sometimes it's small nuances, they need, they need interlocking, they need uh, rooms that can be segmented into groups, they, need, they travel by groups, multi-generational travel. These are just things that we can physically design into our hotels and into our service offering to make sure we can meet their needs. Yeah, yeah, and India has such a young population too, so I think that's certainly an area that we're gonna see more from. So let's shift the conversation into luxury. Um, you sit in that sector. In uh, 2023, as we do every January, we cook off the year with our mega trends. And one of our trends um, spoke to the ultra luxury segment uh, in which your brand sits. And um, that, you know, you have to step it up now, right? Because I think that um, it's a given if you're gonna go into ultra lux luxury, the table stakes are, you know, fine linens and beautiful flowers and marble and all that stuff. So um, it, it, the trend talked about the sort of hyper-focus on experience and service. And 
Um, I, I think that sometimes it probably is difficult um, not to get lost in a sea of competitors. Um, and, and when you look at some of the, uh, Jean-Jacques just talked about um, in the session before, I think they're launching a sailboat experience and the Ritz Carlton has their yachts and Four Seasons has their private jet. Um, I mean, so how do you not get caught up in, and get lost in that vortex of luxury? And um, how, so how do you differentiate yourselves how, when, you, when you look forward at what you're envisioning for Jamira? Mm. Well, the, the first thing is to really understand what trends are relevant and what are real trends and, and what are kind of, what are things that we want to tap into and evolve our brand uh, to be able to tap into those trends. So. Um, just, I think design is so important. The way you actually design physical spaces influences how people behave in those spaces. So inversely, when you observe how you know, people are looking for, I think even post-pandemic, to connect, to have fun, to socialize, and to really uh, be inspired. So um, we're really kind of curious and, and looking at how we can design our public spaces and our lobbies to really enable that to happen naturally. Uh, we've observed in food and beverage, there's really a, like entertainment is just fascinating right now. There's a lot of this move like festival or entertainment mm -hmm. where dining is becoming a, a, an experience. And um, I think Dubai is really at the forefront of this right now. I mean, the emergence of these, you know, there's like festival hour in, in there's a new whole segment. Maybe it used to be called happy hour once upon a time, but it really comes with entertainment, with, uh, with, with shows, with, um, it's really, people want to sit down and not only have amazing food and exceptional service, they also want to be entertained. So um, we have, uh, you know, another expression of that is through beach clubs. I don't know if you've noticed the trend in branded beach clubs, it's just really, just really exploding right now. We have our own concepts in Jumeirah. We have a concept called, uh, or a restaurant called, um, a beach club called Somersault. Mm -hmm. And um, again, it's, it's, there could be someone there on their laptop actually, or there could be someone there with their family or someone actually having fun and, and uh, kind of dancing on the beach. So there's a big emergence now of these of branded concepts. And um, that's really one trend that we're investing in. We'd like to see our concepts taken elsewhere as well. Uh, we have another restaurant called Shimmers. It's a kind of Greek, high-end Greek food restaurant, like nothing like the old Savannah style on Greek. <laughs> really, really high-end expression of fantastic Greek food on the beach, and we're using that concept of ours in our hotel in the Maldives. So branded F&B at a really different level, like really hyper-personalized, hyper-fun, uh, entertainment, that's a real trend we're seeing. And, and then we're passionate about the trends around wellness and specifically longevity. Uh, we're, we're seeing, uh, we, have, we have 19 um, or 20 spas, a uh, third of those are branded to Leeds in our, one of our brands. And we're really curious and we're, we're going to invest into that space of really, really personalized wellness, well-being, where we can curate and um, develop programming for people around longevity or nutrition or spirituality. That's a trend that we're just, we're really going to invest yeah. into. Uh, I think people are, are thirsty for the next level of how do I take care of myself, not just exercising, not just having a, a day treatment or an, hour, an hour's massage, but really how can I take care of myself and ensure that I'm at my peak performance as an individual? And that's really a 360. Um, there's, I mean, people have got more tolerant to invasive as well. I mean, that's sort of, it used to be really scary once upon a time, but I think uh, being able to work with, uh, with scientists and really understand the cutting edge of, of how people can improve the quality of their lives for longer is an area that we're gonna look into and um, we're quite keen to get into that space. Right, right, well that's one of the trends that Varsha yeah. Yeah. spoke about at the and, top, yeah. And then, you know, hyper-personalization. I mean, in the luxury space, you have to do that anyway, but uh, any way that we can truly understand, people have really, you know, in the, in the luxury space, some people want no technology, other people want everything through technology. So being able to, technology is certainly an aid for us to be able to understand in micro detail you know, how one family wants to be treated versus another, or how one individual, how one individual on a different type of trip. So uh, we're really quite strong on being able to use data to uh, enable us to hyper-personalize a service. And that's another, I mean, I'll speak maybe a little bit about it later as well, some of what we're doing in that space. Well, well let's just go right into that because I think that's um, something that's new and, it's, and exciting is that, um, and I believe it's the first in the world, not the mobile check-in part, but the part that it is, um, it's, uh, what do we call it? The uh, right. face facial rec recognition. Facial yeah. recognition that you, that you launched a, a technology working with the Dubai government. 
Yeah, so um, I guess it's, it's not that this is for everyone. You know, some people really don't want their data shared at all, so that's absolutely fine. We are, of course, seeing that some of our guests want hyper-personalization and they're willing to uh, use technology to do that. And we actually got inspiration from the World Cup in, uh, in Qatar where they used new technologies so that every, there was really no queuing. I don't know if anyone went, but it was really, you, if you wanted to, you could upload a lot of personal data, your, your passport and information about yourself, and then you had the freedom to be able to move around pretty freely without having to queue and recheck really in. And generally, the, it was an expression of how they used a lot of technology to manage queuing and everything. And I, I didn't go, but I heard from people who did that it was one of the best experiences ever because you didn't have to do the usual queuing to get into venues and the like. So uh, drawing on inspiration from that, we've developed a software app where guests who want to can actually check in completely remotely. They upload, um, they actually take a selfie of themselves. And we work with Dubai government to make sure that that matches all of their requirements in terms of registration. So. Um, then, uh, if the guest so chooses, they can upload their data. When they arrive at one of our hotels, we can actually, uh, the team will cite them and they can actually already activate their mobile key onto their own phone, the guest's phone, and they can go straight to their room. Now, it's not just about that. That platform actually enables us to, if the guest wants, to be able to uh, completely be able to use their phone as their credit card or as their key card throughout the property. So they could go down to Somersault Beach Club and have a lunch and then decide to go and have a spa treatment and they wouldn't need to, of course, we recognize them. We don't have to say, is it your first time here or have you got a booking? It enables us to be able to hyper-personalize simply by being able to identify that guest. Uh, but it also enables them for seamless payment. It's just easy. They don't have to keep paying for things or taking out their credit cards. So some of our guests absolutely love it. And then, um, of course, it gives us the ability as well to understand the preferences of guests and to be able to really have everything literally on, uh, for our team. They can see that information readily and be able to um, avoid things like, uh, welcome, uh, is it your first time staying with us? Which is, you know, all of us have stayed at a hotel and they're like, no, it's not. I've just come from your, I've just stayed here 20 times, so I've just come from your sister property. So those are just small things that we'd like to eliminate and, and also for those who want to use technology to really be able to hyper-personalize. What about privacy? I mean, because you, now you're getting into biometrics. Like, mm -hmm. is, do you think that, uh, that your travelers will be concerned about that, that there are now, you know, yeah. the hotel, and it's not just the government that has your information, but now a, a, a hotel yeah. company does. I mean, everything is an opt-in basis, so it, guests choose. We give guests a choice as to how they want to interact with us. Some guests may absolutely not want to, you know, this, they, they may not want to use even a credit card. So you really, it's about offering a range. And we always, you know, with, in, for example, with this, uh, with the app we developed in Dubai, that's absolutely working really closely with Dubai Economic Tourism Board to be able to make sure that we match and meet all their criteria and their, their, their requirements. But it's really about offering options. It's not one way or another. We're empowering our guests to be able to choose how they want right. to stay with us. Right. Are you the first um, hotelier to use biometrics in a check-in? Um, I, I don't. I, I know that we're the first in in Dubai. We're the, right. uh, and there's a lot of interest from other companies yeah. to do the same. Mainly because a lot of guests want that nowadays. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I'm quite happy. You know, like take my data. I want to walk onto the aircraft and not be stopped ten times. So right. it just right. depends. And then my mom would not. She's like, no, no, no. They don't want. Like they're not interested in your life. But <laughs> it's fine. Right. But it's it's really about offering really what people want. And younger generations. Are super comfortable, as you all know, with technology. So they're kind of more saying, why can't I do this with my phone, rather than, you know, so it's really the range. It's, it's not one way or another. Right, so speaking of first, so I have to I'll go back to um, the other part of the conversation, which we'll talk a, bit, a little bit about um, branding and luxury, but um, I remember my first time going to, to Dubai about 10 years ago, and I met with the um, CEO of Dubai Tourism, and everything is like, we're going to be the biggest, we're going to be the first, we're going to be the tallest, you know, and, and slowly but surely over the years, you started to see that actually happening. And um, Jameer, which is owned by Dubai Holding, um, it sort of took a page from that book, and uh, we've seen some kind of crazy stuff that, um, that uh, Jameer has been doing. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the Burj Al Arab, which is the, the iconic property. It's in the shape of a sail, and it's sort of like this architectural wonder that, that at the very top, there is a helipad, and the helipad is about um, I don't know, 200 meters high, um, 700 feet for my American friends, and, um, and it's about 21 meters wide. And um, up there, you have seen 
um, Formula One do donuts, you know, and you've seen um, some tennis matches, I think, with Agassi and Federer, right? Yeah. That's right, yeah. Um, and, but, um, and for $10,000 or 8,000 pounds, you can actually land on the helipad if you want to go to the hotel that way. But um, so recently, um, like I'm talking really recently, in the last like eight days, uh, another crazy record was set. And um, it was the first time after three years, probably 350 attempts, that a pilot landed his plane on the top of the uh, Burj Al Arab uh, helicopter. It's so cool. I want to show the video if we can. Okay, we've got uh, 6.1 knots, and it's a very steady wind right now. Okay, and so that like n like that wasn't enough. Wait till you see <laughs> the takeoff because it was equally as ambitious. Right, just give it a second. It did not go into the water. <laughs> And I was like, smarter, dumb enough to go and ride in it the next day. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah so, I guess. So how does this fit into your branding? Like, how, how does this fit into the notion of luxury? Yeah, I think in, in this case, we really worked really closely with Dubai tourism. And as you said, they're always pushing boundaries. And that's so much an expression of Dubai. It's like, how many million tourists? Let's just do it. And they set these targets, these crazy targets, and then they notoriously achieve them. So um, I guess that was really a partnership. And uh, what I was inspired about with, the, with this actually achievement, it was really hard. They'd been training for two years to do this. It's not as simple as it looks. And uh, I got to meet the Red Bull team. And what really inspired me about them is that they, they, um, they asked their team members, What's, if you could do the craziest, biggest dream, what would it be? And in this case, Luke, the pilot, said, I want to land, I want to land my plane on a helipad. So then Red Bull went around the world and looking for a helipad, and they said, we want the best helipad in the world. <laughs> so of course, they found our helipad. And, uh, and then they worked lobbying with the government to see if we could make it happen, and trained notoriously for two years. And before that happened, they had, as you mentioned, multiple attempts. And what we really draw inspiration from, from the Red Bull team is that they ask these questions, and they say, what's impossible? And then let's work together to make it possible. And that takes a lot of grit, a lot of hard work. Uh, a lot of freedom to fail. They need to <laughs> They failed many times before they hit made this happen. And um, I guess that's what what we see for Jumeirah as well. We want us to be a company that thinks what's impossible. Let's go achieve it, and let's work really hard to make it happen. And um, you know, work as a team, try things out, uh, have some fa safe failures. We won't be failing our guests. So of course, we want to make sure that the experience is always pristine on the outside. But that's how you move things forward. And we'd love to see that. Jumeirah, once again, achieves first, like opening the first all-suite hotel, like the Burj Al Arab, back in 25 years ago, and really brings this new level, this new expression of hospitality to the world. And uh, that's where we drew inspiration from Red Bull on this achievement from. Awesome. I can't wait to see what's going to happen next up there. Um, so but, yeah. I was going to say, aside from that, it's also about creating experiences for our guests. So. You know, our guests loved this. They were cheering on. There were people inside the hotel watching it. There were people down on the beach with us. So it's really, we're looking to see how can we also create unique experiences, be it for our loyalty guests or be it for kind of making, you know, making it fun to stay at a Jumeirah hotel, that you have access to things that you can't buy. And in luxury today, it's really about what can I have that I can't buy? And that's what drives loyalty. That what, that's what drives the X factor on being able to drive Again, revenue to our business, we're a possible business. But it's really about delighting people and creating, creating uh, partnerships, memberships, uh, alliances that can really create unique offerings for our guests. And, and that's where we see delight. You know, when, we, when, we took, when we offer this to our guests, they really get excited about it because they can't have that somewhere else. Yeah, that, that's great. That's lovely. Um, so before we go, which we have about a half a minute, what's the best advice you ever received pertaining <laughs> to business? The best advice was, um, 
was probably just, uh, I don't know, it's talk less and listen more, like just be highly perceptive. I think listening is so much more important than, I don't have all the answers, uh, but I really listen to my team, I listen to the customers, uh, I talk to people, I love to talk to competitors, uh, sometimes their colleagues, sometimes their colleagues again, and um, I think listening is probably, and you know, deep listening, a lot of times we think we're listening and we're not, like deep listening is probably the most yeah. important thing ever. It also creates connection yeah. when you really listen to someone. So Lovely. Well, thank you so much. It was so wonderful to have you on stage with us, and thank you for giving us your first global interview. So welcome. <laughs>